Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event, the Can Eat Cancer Nutrition Care Pathway for People with Cancer Carers and Health Professionals. To begin tonight, I'd like to uh, do acknowledgement of country, Northwestern Melbourne Primary Health Network. Would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which our work takes place, the Wanjiri Woi Warong people, the Boon Warong people, and the Wathurong people. We pay respects to elders past, present, and emerging, as well as pay respects to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the session with us today or tonight. Um, before we begin the session, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, all the attendees, as you've entered into the uh, webinar, you have been muted. Um, but we would love you to um, ask questions. So please ask questions via the Q&A box. Um, here's a diagram here. Q&A will be at the end of the presentation. So questions will be anonymous to protect your privacy. This session is being recorded, again, to protect your privacy. Please ensure you join the session using your name. Uh, sometimes you might come up with, uh, you know, Brian's iPhone and we won't know who that is. So please uh, change your name um, and that way we can have registrations completed. Uh, this is a little bit about the agenda. We expect the session to finish about eight o'clock and we have three presenters on today. Um, our speakers panel, we've got Janelle uh, Lo uh, Lo Lolliga. I hope, hope I've said that correctly, Janelle. I've been practising today. Janelle is the head of the Nutrition and Speech Pathology and the project manager for the I Can Eat project. Janelle has provided leadership to the statewide program of work, the Victorian Cancer Malnutrition uh, Collaborative BCMC since 2011. We also have Rebecca McIntosh. Rebecca is a project officer for the Can Eat project at PMCC. Rebecca has previously led two statewide cancer mal nutrition projects and was co-author of the Malnutrition Governance Toolkit. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Jane Crow won't be uh, available to uh, attend tonight, but she has actually um, recorded, pre-recorded a session for us. So Dr. Jane Crow is a GP at Big Dean Clinic and Australian Prostate Cancer Centre. And then we've got Tanith Lamaro, uh, Tanith is a dietitian by background and currently the manager of podiatry dietetics. Did I say that right? Uh, diabetes, diabetes nurse education at Access Health and Community. So I will stop sharing and we'll uh, say uh, hello to our first speaker. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Um, so thanks for that introduction. So as, as Yvonne said, my name's Janelle um, and I'll be starting the webinar this evening. Um, so tonight we're sharing with you a freely available cancer nutrition care pathway. And this is a collective suite of resources known as the CANEAT pathway resources. So you can see here tonight's agenda, we'll be just running through a little bit of background for you just to give you context. Um, and then showing you the resources that we've been creating over the last um, 18 months. We'll talk about those resources um, in action. So we'll use case studies and show you how to actually go about applying them in clinical practice. And then we'll have time for a panel discussion. So by the end of tonight's session, you'll be able to hopefully explain the role of nutrition in cancer care and its impact on patient outcomes, demonstrate the ability to use the CANEAT pathway resources, which we'll show you in clinical practice, how to identify clinical scenarios where these resources could be implemented, and list real world practical tips that can be applied in clinical practice to implement them. So before we proceed, we'd like to show you a short animation for you about cancer and nutrition.
Good nutrition is essential for all people with cancer throughout the entire cancer path. Three out of five people with cancer will have a nutrition issue that is making it hard for them to eat well. At least one in four will develop malnutrition. Up to three of five will develop sarcopenia and many may develop cachexia. Optimal nutrition is critical in preventing and treating these complex conditions. Good nutrition equals better health outcomes. Meeting nutrition needs due to increased energy and protein requirements is challenging. Cancer diagnosis, treatment and side effects may create further issues with eating and drinking. Optimal nutrition care should include risk stratification to ensure all patients are supported, with those at highest risk receiving care from a dietitian. Without adequate nutrition, patients can experience the need for artificial nutrition support, such as enteral or parenteral feeding, unintentional muscle and weight loss, which can lead to health issues such as malnutrition, sarcopenia and cachexia, as well as fatigue poor tolerance of cancer treatment and treatment interruptions, an admission to hospital and longer length of stay, and a longer recovery. The Can Eat pathway provides you with evidence-based nutrition information and practical tips. You can view the Can Eat pathway as a person with cancer or carer, or as a health professional. Everyone has a role to play. Optimal nutrition care requires a multidisciplinary team approach. As a dietitian, oncologist, GP, nurse, allied health professional, or other health professional working in a hospital or community-based setting, the CanEat pathway can help you deliver optimal nutrition care to your patients and their carers. Have your patients ever said, I feel so nauseous I can't eat, and you didn't have a resource to provide them? Do they ask about help to combat fatigue, to manage their weight loss or weight gain? Do you regularly discuss nutrition with your patients or direct them to further nutrition resources or advice? Patients with cancer and their carers are seeking credible information and view nutrition as very important, but have not always felt supported by health professionals. The Can Eat Pathway provides resources and templates at your fingertips. Within the Can Eat Pathway, you can watch a video, listen to an audio clip, read a fact sheet on a topic relevant to you, Explore the toolkit for easy to use templates and resources. Boost your own knowledge and understanding of nutrition and cancer. Get patients back to the things they love by supporting them to eat well. Help them to build strength, boost energy and lift mood. Ensure they make every mouthful count as the Can Eat pathway serves up bite-sized nutrition information and support for all people with cancer and their carers regardless of where they are on the cancer path. Everything is on the table. So nutrition plays a really important role within cancer care, but nutrition can be complex. Nutrition needs will differ greatly for an individual without cancer, compared to someone with cancer. And those needs for someone with cancer will vary depending on where in the cancer pathway they are, for example, at diagnosis or perhaps late in their treatment, their diagnosis, what treatment they will have, uh, or sorry, have or will have, and other factors such as someone's social situation, emotional state and other comorbidities. So for those with cancer, common conditions such as malnutrition, sarcopenia and cachexia have negative clinical and economic outcomes. So cancer malnutrition can occur in up to 61% of patients, sarcopenia or muscle loss in up to 40% of patients and cachexia somewhere in the realm of 50 to 80% of patients. Evidence supports early identification of nutrition risk and those who require nutrition support and perhaps a dietitian intervention. However, it's really important to highlight that everyone has a role to play. Optimal nutrition care for an individual with cancer requires a multidisciplinary team approach. 
Early identification of nutrition risk using a tool such as the Malnutrition Screening Tool or MST is a great example of why the involvement of the MDT is so important for optimal nutrition. So screening will typically be undertaken by a nurse or perhaps an allied health assistant, depending on the setting, but this can actually be done by anyone, the patient themselves, a GP, an oncologist or other allied health professionals. If someone is identified as at risk of malnutrition, a referral to a dietitian for a full nutrition assessment and intervention is indicated. So now let me give you some context to the work that we've been doing, led here out of Peter Mac. Our team developed the CanEat Pathway in 2018-19, and it's a freely available nutrition resource housed, housed on the Peter Mac website. It covers a range of information and resources about nutrition and cancer, specifically to help both people with cancer and their carers, but also health professionals. Although it's a really wonderful resource, we recognise that enhancements to its usability and testing in clinical practice were needed. So hence, now let me introduce you to the I Can Eat project, which is the work that we've been doing over the past 18 months. So kindly funded and supported by the Victorian Department of Health. The aim of the overall project was to support the implementation and uptake of the Can Eat pathway by people with cancer, carers and health professionals. The objectives were to modify the Can Eat pathway into a more usable and interactive format utilising experience-based co-design. The other objective was to also conduct multi-site implementation with the, the resources using clinical utility testing. So the I Can Eat project has consisted of five stages run over 18 months. It commenced in November 2020 and finished in May this year. So stage one was the project development phase, which included key stakeholder engagement, and planning and processing to gain ethics approval. Stage two involved a comprehensive literature review and environmental scan to inform updates to the current CANIC pathway and identify necessary modifications required, um, required to the existing resources. Stage three determined priority areas of focus for our new resources, so via a consumer survey, and forming, surveying and interviewing our seven implementation teams who were made up of multidisciplinary health professionals working in cancer care. So drawing on experience-based co-design methodology, our four co-design workshops brought patients, carers and health professionals together with our graphic designer, Green Scribble, to design and refine 46 new interactive resources. Stage four involved real world testing of our new interactive resources at our seven implementation teams health services. So this included four acute hospitals, both metropolitan and regional sites, two community health services and one GP practice. We sought further consumer feedback via another survey and repeated our implementation team survey and team interviews at the end of this clinical utility testing period. And stage five involved finalising our resources and the website, further dissemination and preparing our final report for recommendations for future work. So I'd now like to hand over to Rebecca McIntosh, who will show you our new resources. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Janelle, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so this is a complete list of all 46 new resources that have been developed during the COS co-design workshops, as Janelle mentioned. And um, these resources are in addition to that full can -Eat pathway, um, that larger PDF document that we were referring to. So the final version of all these interactive resources are now freely available on the can -Eat pathway webpage. And these resources have been designed for both people with cancer and their carers and multidisciplinary health professionals, so dietitians and non-dietitians. As you can see, there are multiple different formats, including a postcard, infographic fact sheets, animations and toolkits. And I'll now take you through some examples of these resources that are available and how these might be used. Uh, the A5 postcard and general infographic fact sheets can be used as visual prompts to direct patients, carers, health professionals to further information, such as the more detailed CanEat Pathway resources or the full 
pathway document itself. And from our clinical utility testing, we know that printed copies on display in clinic waiting room areas, in outpatient settings, on clinician desks and displayed on consulting room walls, um, all these things provided really strong visual cues which prompted clinicians to disseminate and patients and carers to seek out nutrition information. So if we zoom in on the postcard, You'll see the resource has a QR code to direct people back to the main CanEat Pathway webpage. And there's visual information on what is the CanEat Pathway and also details regarding resources available. The general infographic fact sheet, if we take a closer look at that one, also has similar features as well. The QR code, pathway details and information on other available resources. And the version that you can see here on your screen at the moment is for patients and carers. However, there's also a version for health professionals as well, which follows a very similar format. There are a set of 12 cancer type infographic fact sheets, one for patients and carers, and also a separate set of 12 cancer type infographic fact sheets for health professionals. All fact sheets include the QR codes and links back to the main web page. The cancer type fact sheets for patients and carers, if we take a closer look at that one, all follow a similar format, which includes uh, what can you expect and what can you do section. And it's written in an action-based narrative. These fact sheets are designed for non dietitian health professionals to hand out to patients and carers, with the idea being if a dietitian is involved, there may likely be specific tailored advice they would be providing to the patient or carer. So this could, however, be a good resource to provide patients and carers whilst they're waiting to see a dietitian. The cancer type fact sheet for health professionals, if we take a closer look and zoom in, also um, all follows a similar format, which includes the CANEAT model, highlighting likely condition complexity and the ability for self-management, along with our what can you expect and what can you do section, which is similar, as you recall, to the patient and carer version. There's also some um, tips for clinicians as well. The health professional focused cancer type fact sheets are designed as a quick reference guide for all health professionals, such as GPs, but also other medical staff, cancer nurses, acute and community based allied health professionals, and might be of benefit also to dietitians that are new to an oncology workload or those working with patients and carers during the transition of care. Uh, there are an additional set of eight infographic fact sheets for patients and carers each focused on a unique topic not previously available in the existing cancer nutrition resources. So these topics include managing weight gain, myth busting, and finding a dietitian. And the remaining five infographic fact sheets form part of a series in the cancer path. If we take a look at this one, each of the different time points in the cancer path are represented as a fact sheet. So preparing for treatment during and immediately after treatment, long-term survivorship, including living with advanced cancer and end of life care. So this is an example of step four, which is the long-term survivorship. So these resources are designed once again for all health professionals to hand out to patients and carers. And from our clinical utility testing, we know that many cancer nurses and community dietitians found this step four, nutrition and cancer long-term survivorship fact sheet useful um, in helping patients transition from their eating immediately after initial treatment. So to recap, I've shown you the postcard and a number of different infographic fact sheets just then. And these fact sheets form a component of the document toolkits for patients, carers and health professionals. There are a number of additional toolkit resources available as well for patients and carers and for health professionals that can be found on the Can Eat Pathway webpage. And finally, in the suite of resources, there are four animations that have been developed. A short one minute, 25 second general animation has been developed with all audiences in mind. And then there's two slightly longer animations. So one for people with cancer and their carers as a key audience, and another developed for health professional audiences in mind. And this was the one that we played at the start of tonight's session. So these animations are tailored to the different audiences, but they stem from the first animation. So the content is similar. 
And then the fourth and final animation is intended for viewing by health professionals. And it discusses the role of nutrition risk screening and emphasises the multidisciplinary team responsibility for nutrition. So I'm now going to pause the presentation and actually play that uh, animation for you now. Nutrition risk screening is key for early identification of nutrition issues. It helps identify those at risk of malnutrition or those already malnourished who could benefit from nutrition support. It should consist of two parts, use of a valid, reliable screening tool appropriate to the population in which it's applied and automatic referral to a dietitian for known high nutrition risk patients. Those with high-risk cancer diagnoses and treatment regimens should bypass screening and be referred directly to a dietitian for early nutrition assessment and treatment. What screening tool should be used? The Malnutrition Screening Tool, MST, is an easy two-question validated screening tool for identifying malnutrition risk. When should malnutrition risk screening be completed? Screening should be completed at diagnosis, repeated at intervals through each stage of treatment and occur across all treatment and healthcare settings. How should the malnutrition screening tool be completed? Malnutrition risk screening can be performed by any healthcare staff, patient or carer. It may depend on the setting, available workforce, or specific health service policies. Let's go through the MST questions together. Has the patient lost weight without trying? This applies to the past six months. If yes, quantify how much weight loss and score accordingly. Only use unsure after you've explored whether you can quantify weight loss by asking, have you noticed your clothes are looser? Or has your belt come in a notch? Has the patient been eating poorly because of a decreased appetite? If the patient is eating less than three quarters of their usual meal size, then select yes. Eating poorly may be due to other eating issues, such as difficulty chewing or swallowing. Score accordingly. Add your score from question one and two to get the total MST score. If patients score a total of two or more, they are considered at risk of malnutrition and should be referred to a dietitian for assessment and treatment. This score helps nutrition services prioritise work by targeting those at greatest risk. Patients that score less than two are not currently at risk of malnutrition, but should be re-screened with the MST at regular intervals to detect any change over time. Remember, nutrition risk screening is key for early identification of nutrition issues in cancer patients. Everyone can be involved. A systematic, multidisciplinary team approach will lead to the best outcomes for your patients and your service. So now we're going to talk about how to use the Canic Pathway resources in clinical practice. So we're going to talk through some case studies about how you might link these resources that you've just had a glimpse of to different patient scenarios that you might come across in everyday practice. So just a reminder, as Yvonne said, said at the start of the webinar, if you've got any questions that pop up, um, please use the Q&A function. Um, to ask those and we will um, try and get to those in the panel session uh, later in this evening's webinar. So this first scenario, so scenario one, we want to look at how do we use the Canic Pathway resources to help provide optimal care 
optimal nutrition care to a patient. So scenario one, a practice nurse is seeing a 62-year-old patient with prostate cancer who's currently on hormone therapy and has finished a course of radiotherapy. So this patient has lots of queries regarding eating healthily following cancer treatment and is seeking practical tips that he can apply. So as a practice nurse seeing this patient, what I would do, first of all, is visit the Canet Pathway webpage. So you can see here, you can see the webpage link at the top, and this is what it looks like when you go to that first link. You can see there's an animation to click into, and then there's three options. You can look at a little bit more about the Canet Pathway. The second tile and the one in the middle is the Canet Pathway for people with cancer and their carers, so patient-specific resources. And then the final box is for, for health professionals. So in this case, for this man with prostate cancer, we're going to click on the middle tile. So the Canet Pathway for people with cancer and their carers. So this then brings you to a full list of the Canet Pathway resources for people with cancer and their carers. So if we zoom in, so on the full list of resources on this page, so in the red box, so that's what you can see now, you can see there's lots of resources listed there. And, and many of these could be provided to this particular gentleman with prostate cancer. As a practice nurse in this scenario, I could look firstly at the nutrition and cancer postcard. So you can see that circled there, that's one of the top resources. And that's a really general introduction to the, um, to the CANEAT pathway resources. So it looks like this. So this is something that is really great to have printed off within your practice, or you can print it, off, print it off at the time of seeing a patient and provide that to them so that they can access the web page themselves and, and have a look around and find any further information that they might be seeking. So step four, the infographic fact sheet. So this is looking at um, the time point in long-term survivorship. So this is obviously relevant for this patient with prostate cancer who's now in maintenance, hormone therapy, has finished radiotherapy. Um, so this would provide some good tips uh, specific to the time point that they're in and really helpful and appropriate for the practice nurse to be handing out. So this is what this particular two-page fact sheet looks like. And um, hopefully that would give some good tips and some good links to other useful resources as well. So for further practical tips, the other fact sheet that might be useful for this particular patient could be around myth busting. So the myth busting fact sheet could be useful for this patient to distinguish what is an evidence-based nutrition intervention versus something that uh, does not have a lot of evidence behind it. So it looks like this. Um, so we've covered off on the sort of top 12 myths um, in relation to nutrition and cancer in this fact sheet. And then for further practical tips for this gentleman, what could be provided is the nutrition transitions fact sheet and the nutrition transitions package. Now, we didn't go into too much detail before about this particular package, but it includes a presentation that patients and carers can view to help with transitioning from an on-treatment nutrition focus of a high-energy, high-protein diet um, to something that, that mirrors uh, more general healthy eating, which is completely appropriate for where this, this particular gentleman is at. So you can see here um, the, the fact sheet that covers off on tips for a healthy balanced diet within this. Um, and then the self-guided presentation looks like this. So some really detailed information there to, to guide patients and carers step by step through um, achieving, I guess, a, a healthier diet in that survivorship phase. So that's where we would start as a, a practice nurse in that particular scenario. So now let's move on to scenario two. So a GP is seeing a 70 year old female with a recent diagnosis of breast cancer. So this particular patient is one week 
post cycle one of chemotherapy and she's experiencing a reduced appetite and low grade nausea. So as a GP, I think my first priority um, in this case is to optimise this patient's antiemetic regimen and, and try and settle that nausea, which might inadvertently improve her appetite. So secondly, I'd like to find useful information to provide to my patient that might help with her reduced appetite. So I'm going to start with health pathways. So the link to the Canic Pathway resources appears in many places within Health Pathways, although it should be noted that some of the links in the, to the resources are not quite as comprehensively embedded as we would like. There's, there's definitely some further work to do there. But remember, you can also find the Canic Pathway resources, um, so not only through these means, but also directly from the Peter Mac website. So within Health Pathways, I would look for relevant information under the oncology tab and under that oncology tab then you can find links and information uh, under oncology referrals and or oncology advice. So under the oncology advice section you can look up Peter Mac specifically which links to the Peter Mac website so that would be one avenue to find information or via oncology referrals and cancer support services. And then you can look through um, the nutrition and healthy lifestyle section where a direct link to the Canic Pathway resources exists under the Peter Mac Nutrition and Dietetic Services tab. So that might be easy for some. Alternatively, you can find um, information using the search function, so via allied health and community nursing, um, and also via di dietetic referrals or the nutrition sections as well. So whether you get to the Canate Pathway resources via Health Pathways, or whether you actually go directly to the Canate Pathway webpage on the Peter Mac website, or as an additional tip, Google will get you there pretty quickly as well. The next step is to direct your patient to the Canic Pathway for people with cancer and their carers. So they can view this online or they might want to print off relevant fact sheets or, or parts of the pathway. So once you're into the main page and you've clicked on the patient and carer tile, as we've just seen, this brings you to the Canic Pathway for People with Cancer and Their Carers uh, page. And this is where you can explore the full detailed Canic Pathway resource. So where we've got the arrow pointing there, that's to the large PDF document. And there's loads of information in there. And specifically for our patient um, that we're seeing, the GP is seeing with breast cancer, we would like to look in that Canic Pathway at section five. And this would be nutrition and issues in your cancer path and look up information and strategies for both poor appetite, there's a section on, and there's also a section on nausea and vomiting. So that would give you as the health professional lots of tips and tricks um, as to the advice that you can provide to the patient then and there, but also a specific resource that the patient can look at um, over, you know, uh, over the following days or weeks or, or however long they might need that advice for um, to give them specific action-based tips um, around what they can eat or perhaps things to avoid. So in addition, further down on the same page, on the patient and carer pathway page, you would also find the breast cancer fact sheet. So you can see there, what that looks like, all of our cancer type fact sheets are two page fact sheets. They follow the same format. They're action based, as Rebecca has said, um, and really um, quite vibrant to look at and, and hopefully useful both from a health professional point of view and for patients and carers. So the next fact sheet that could be useful for this lady uh, with breast cancer would be the nutrition step two during treatment fact sheet. So for this patient, um, given she's experiencing uh, a decreased appetite, some nausea and vomiting, I would also consider a referral to perhaps the acute dietitian at the cancer centre where this patient is being treated. 
um, for chemotherapy, or if that is not a possibility, um, then a, a referral to a community-based um, dietitian would be also appropriate. So I'm now going to hand over to Rebecca, who's going to talk you through uh, the next couple of case studies. So scenario three, um, as an acute dietitian working perhaps in a metro hospital, seeing a 56-year-old man with lung cancer who's now three months post radiotherapy, um, who would also potentially benefit from a referral being made um, for ongoing nutrition support to a community-based dietitian. What sort of resources can um, the Can Eat Pathway provide for you as that clinician trying to navigate and support this patient with lung cancer post um, radiotherapy treatment? So I could visit the Can Eat Pathway webpage um, and I could click on the patient and carer tab like you've seen Janelle show you before and we could collect some information um, on, depending upon the step that the patient is up to. So in this case the patient has completed their initial treatment, they're on a, a maintenance type therapy and, and this long-term survivorship fact sheet would be quite appropriate to provide to someone now that they are sort of five months post um, radiotherapy. So I can print this resource out and provide it to the patient. Um, the patient will also then have access to the QR code um, and they can go back and look at the pathway themselves for some further information. And then as a health professional, perhaps I'm reasonably new to the oncology workload um, and it might be helpful for me to go back and look in um, the health professional section of the CANIC pathway webpage. So I click on the health professional tab and it brings us up to a similar page like the patient and carer that has a full list of the can eat pathway resources um, which if we increase the size of that too looks very similar to the patient and carer section as well but what you'll note there is actually the um, animation that we played for you um, at the start of tonight's session is also there and able to be viewed as well. Um, so for this particular um, patient in mind, um, there could be many resources that we could provide. Um, but as a clinician sort of upskilling in the lung cancer space, um, I can go in and look at this fact sheet that's for a health professional audience and understand um, some of the things that I might need to consider as a dietitian and things that I might um, want to do and, um, and other information that I can be linked to. Um, I should also consider um, referring this patient on to a community-based dietitian for that ongoing nutrition support and the nutrition navigator which you can see um, circled there on your screen. Um, that's a tool that we haven't gone into much detail about but I'll show you a little bit about that now. So that contains two tools that help health professionals to navigate appropriate nutrition care and transitions. Um, so the first part of the Nutrition Navigator is a discharge planning checklist. So as a clinician in the hospital, I can use this checklist um, just to make sure I don't forget any steps along the way, that I'm being prompted um, to communicate information accordingly to GPs and to other primary care providers about this patient's care. And then the second component of the Nutrition Navigator is also a decision support tool. Um, so there's a lot of detail um, that you can see on the screen there. Do go in and have a, a further look at the document yourself. Um, this decision support tool is really a bit of a guide to help navigate different options for nutrition care and also decisions regarding whether a dietitian is required or not to support appropriate nutrition care planning. Um, so there's information, the one I'm showing there on the screen is for a dietitian, but we've also developed a separate um, pathway tool for GPs as well. So that would help support that particular lung cancer patient and the clinician perhaps newer to the oncology workload or perhaps less familiar with looking after or managing a patient with lung cancer. 
And then we've got our final scenario here on the screen. So scenario four, a community physiotherapist is seeing a colorectal cancer survivor who also happens to have type two diabetes as well. Um, in seeing them in the context of um, completing treatment um, and undergoing rehabilitation. And the patient has questions regarding nutrition after cancer treatment and whether their eating patterns are okay for their diabetes. So in this scenario, I'm thinking as a, a community-based uh, non dietitian health professional um, that I would be looking about making a referral to my colleague, the community-based dietitian, for some individual tailored advice for this patient um, in terms of their uh, healthy eating strategies, taking into account their diabetes as well. However, in the short term, there's a waiting time to see the dietitian. Um, what can I do in the meantime to try and help support this patient and provide some information in the short term? So I can go as the physio to the patient and carer tab on the Can Eat Pathway webpage, and I can select the nutrition postcard, which you've seen before. So I might have printed these off, or I might have some already printed sitting on my desk that I can hand to the patient and direct them to some further information. And because um, we know that this patient has um, a lower gastrointestinal type cancer and there might be some other specific information we can provide them that's a bit more relevant to their particular type of cancer, um, we could potentially print this sheet off as well um, and give the patient just a little bit of additional information whilst they're waiting for that dietitian one-on-one -on -one tailored advice as well. Okay, so now we're going to invite our colleagues, Jane and Tanith, to join us for a panel discussion to answer um, any questions you as the audience might have. Um, so please use the Q&A function to submit any questions that you might have. Uh, firstly, we're gonna be joined by uh, Dr. Jane Crow, who unfortunately cannot be with us live tonight, but has recorded her experiences of being part of an implementation team and undergoing uh, the clinical utility testing of these new can -Eat pathway resources that we've just shown you tonight. Um, so Jane is a GP at Deep Dean Surgery and was also the site lead for her practices implementation team. So I'm just gonna share a pre-recorded video with you now. Thank you, Janelle and Rebecca, for inviting me to ask uh, to speak tonight. Um, I apologise, I cannot be there in person as a live panellist. Um, but our implementation team was made up of four members, myself, another GP, our practice nurse, and the dietitian that works within our practice. And when we're invited to be part of the implementation team of um, the Can Eat Pathways resource, um, I, we jumped at the offer. Um, I have um, an interest in cancer survivorship and uh, I'm looking at all aspects of patient care and health and preventative and uh, trying to improve their quality of life. Um, and things like um, referring to exercise physiology or psychology is, is much easier, but nutrition, there's a plethora of, of, of information out there and a bit of a, a lack of evidence um, resource evidence-based resources for GPs to access and I thought it was fantastic that we could be part of this um, program and get um, early access <laughs> to this um, uh, I call it a guiding light through all the the loud confusing misinformation available on the world wide web with respect to cancer nutrition so uh, it, was, it was great to be part, involved um, so in regards to the clinical, so what we've done is, is because I'm not there as a live panelist, Janelle and I have, have got questions and some answers that you try to anticipate what you might ask. So this is one of the questions. In regards to the clinical utility testing of the Can Eat pathway resources, what were we focused on? Well, our main aim was to really make the Can Eat resources visible to the clinicians and to the patients. We wanted to inform the clinical staff about the Can Eat uh, pathways, 
um, and also the malnutrition risk tool. Um, and we did that by uh, having a team meeting and we told all the clinicians about it. Uh, we had um, postcards um, given to the um, clinical staff. And we just kept reminding our clinicians that it's available. We also tried to inform our cancer patients and the carers about the CANEAT program. Um, we had a TV in our waiting room with the video playing. Uh, and we had information and links on our website and also the postcards once again in the clinician's rooms that could prompt the patient and or the clinician. So we were trying to just increase the visibility and usability of the CANEAT pathways. Um, so the next question, what was our experience as an implementation team member during the clinical utility testing? So first of all, really positive. Uh, we loved our meetings with Rebecca and Janelle who helped us implement and focus on what were, what we, what were our needs and for our patients in our particular area. Um, it was a really good quality improvement event for our practice. So we worked at a practice level as a team to try and start improving access to evidence-based nutritional um, resources for our patients with cancer. Uh, it was really lovely to work alongside the dietitian who works at our practice. Um, and I just personally enjoyed the um, cognitive challenge to break down the needs and think about how to implement a positive change for the patients at our practice. So the next question, what were the things that worked for us? Well, I think that the team uh, approach worked really well and everyone had input and um, ideas about what would work. Uh, the team meeting was really helpful to sort of get the message across. Um, adding the candidate resource to care plans in general practice and also to the 75 plus health assessments for patients with a cancer diagnosis. We are still uh, trying to do that. Um, and also the really interesting thing was carer interest. They'd see on the television or uh, the postcards or on the internet, uh, on our um, website, um, that it was available and would ask us about it. So that was good. Uh, what were the thing? The next question was, what were the things we found hard? Well, this thing called the COVID pandemic, <laughs> um, it made implementation of this more difficult because there were so many other issues that took the energy and time away from um, our focus to implement it. Um, GPs working from home, it just made it a bit harder to maintain the messaging with our clinicians uh, to keep the visibility of the, the CANEAT resources going. Um, telehealth um, with patients, I found were just a different dynamic. There were different consultations um, uh, as opposed to face-to-face. -face. So, you know, if they're in the in the practice, you could just, you know, hand them, it's very easy, you know, patient with a cancer diagnosis, you could just give them the postcard and would prompt the, 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 the idea of nutrition. Even if they weren't ready to accept that information, just to um, plant that seed that there's a resource available if you need to. But on with telehealth was, you know, we could email the link, which was a very good way to do it, but it's a bit more clunky. It, it was a bit, uh, and added another cognitive load to the consultation, having to sort of, you know, what's your email address and you know, did you get it? That sort of stuff. Um, the other thing we found hard was sometimes patient, there were patient barriers. I mean, some people had some apathy. They just didn't see that as, as a priority for them. They, you know, it was very common. Well, I know what to eat and I, I you know, trying to undo some of the misinformation was difficult um, and some just weren't interested at that particular time or or just that for patients with barriers they had so much going on in their lives with treatments and doctors and allied health um, and they had information overload and they really weren't ready to accept that information or referrals or think about it at that particular time in that particular consultation so the next question, what are the best tips I can give other GP practices and other health professionals working in primary care in regards to using the CANEAT pathway resources? Well, first of all, maybe if you have a list of cancer resources, just add it to your list of resources because um, you might have lots of patients with cancer. You might have only a few per year, but if you've got a little list of, um, of exercise, psychology, um, financial, um, other things, um, and you can add this to that so that you can pull it up and it reminds you and as, as a prompt. Um, I think also adding the malnutrition screening risk tool to care plans on the 75 plus health assessments for people with cancer is a just really good reminder to keep asking and trying to identify these patients at risk. 
I, I love the leaflets or postcards to hand out because having them on the desk, it's so easy just to prompt that discussion or, uh, as I said, once again, plant that seed about nutrition if they're not ready at that stage, but a lot are, they might go to the resource. Um, let your clinical team know about the pathways, but also about the, um, the malnutrition uh, screening tool. Um, if you can, add it to the website, TV newsletters uh, for patient driven interest. And the other thing is maybe just keep on asking the patient about nutrition at every review, just as you might ask about mood or exercise, because it may become a priority for the patient who initially had reluctance, um, but may now see the need and be ready to accept information and referral. I mean, having said that, if the patient's ready, easy, but it's, it's for these people are trying to sort of uh, that motivational sort of interview, trying to get them across the, the, the mark to seeing, um, having some nutritional assistance. So the next question is, I, um, I believe, or this is a statement, I believe as a GP that we could pay more attention to the nutrition needs of our patients who have had uh, or who have cancer. So if we could, I think if we could ask patients with cancer about nutrition and do a quick malnutrition risk screen, offer the information to the patient and or the carer about the CAN-EAT pathways and refer those at risk to, uh, of malnutrition to a dietitian with cancer expertise if required. So thank you very much for having me. I hope that answered all your questions and hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Okay, back to you. A huge thanks to, to Jane for pre-recording that for us and contributing to, to our panel. Um, I'd like to invite Tanith Lamaro to join us as well. Thanks, Tanith. So Tanith is a dietitian, but also the manager of podiatry, dietetics and diabetes nurse education at Access Health and Community. And so Tanith um, also um, was part of one of our clinical fertility testing teams. So as Jane described, um, her team at Deep Dean Surgery was our GP uh, practice that participated of our seven implementation teams and Tanith was part of one of our community health sites. Um, so what we might do is just we're going to quiz you a little bit Tanith if that's all right sure. about your experience um, as part of the clinical utility testing and um, just to, to get your insights about um, things that worked, things that didn't. Um, Rebecca I just might get you to mute a moment thank you and so Tana the first question can you just talk us through first of all who made up your implementation team at Access Health and Community? Sure so we took the allied health approach um, we had two people from the team that I lead which are two dietitians we also had an occupational therapist and a physiotherapist so right from the onset, we were trying to engage perhaps some disciplines who wouldn't necessarily ordinarily see their role as a nutrition advocate, um, but getting them engaged from across that spectrum. And so for your multidisciplinary team then at Access Health and Community, can you talk us through what your team was focused on as part of the clinical utility testing? So what resources you actually tested mm -hmm. and, and how you went about doing that? So I think um, we had two core focuses. One was actually to get the information across to our health professionals, but then also, of course, with our clients who were coming through. Um, so it was a bit dependent on the clients themselves in terms of their needs, um, but we were looking at using those specific options for people um, if they had a specific cancer, but we're also then looking at the options where they were more generalised, like you showcased earlier, around the nausea or vomiting and so being able to link them in. But I think the other part that became um, really evident was when the clinicians were actually seeing people at different stages of their cancer journey as well. So we often end up seeing people post their um, treatment. They might be longer term survivors. So we're trying to recognise too that some of these people might still be following dietary advice or be confused about nutrition information post their acute care um, and actually trying to realign that with where their health was at, at the moment. So some of those extension um, documents was actually something we looked at um, using as well. So we, I think access really in terms of what the client need was in front of us, um, but certainly from um, the health professional perspective, it was introducing people to that suite of resources and getting their feedback around those. Um, and particularly those introduction um, videos uh, seemed to be really well received when we presented them and made them available. 
Mm. Brilliant. And how how did the team go during this time? Obviously, if we had our time again, we wouldn't run our clinical utility testing during a, during a global pandemic. Um, so obviously that was a challenge for all of us, you know, from our end actually running the project, but also for, for you as um, clinicians on the ground trying to test these resources under trying circumstances. Um, you know, how, how did the team go? What worked well? I think for us, the really great thing, because we were doing a combination of telehealth as well as in-person consults, that the resources weren't restricted to one platform. So it was really useful that people were able to send a link via an email or use a QR code, um, even without having to hand out something physical. So we had an approach um, in our waiting rooms that a lot of our resources, physical nature, were actually all collected up um, from a um, COVID you know, safety perspective. We didn't have as many things uh, available to hand out or plastered onto um, boards and things. So for us, I think it was really important that they had the accessibility. Um, and that actually meant that um, despite the consult type um, or despite not having that physical nature of things to hand out, although we did have the postcards for the inpatient, the clients who were seeing in clinic, um, the ability to actually continue to give them resources um, from a different way, um, being online or using the QR code was actually really helpful. So I don't think it actually disadvantaged us from that perspective. Um, probably one thing to mention though in that um, utility testing phase is that we were hoping perhaps to broaden our linkages um, with some cancer pathways for referrals and because the acute sector was under some um, pressure, some of their clinics weren't running and therefore referrals perhaps were a few less than we would have loved. Um, we really hope that this is actually a nice way to continue that partnership work going forward um, so we can see that flow of greater numbers through. Um, so I think it was probably for us a numbers game in the end um, of people actually accessing our service um, to be able to troll greater a number of resources. And I, I guess off the back of that question about sort of the things that worked well, did, what was the mm. patient feedback in regards to the resources? Yeah, so I think it was lovely um, to hear the patient's feedback that they could be a bit independent about things as well um, and that what they were seeing, I suppose, um, online was accessible to them, their families, the people who are important to them. Um, but also we actually had some interesting feedback that they directed their own health professionals that they may have been seeing through the resource as well, um, which I think is a really nice um, consumer-centric um, aspect of it, that they may have been seeing or going back to see their GP or seeing um, a physiotherapist or someone else and actually saying, hey, these are a great thing or this is what I've read, can you help me with? Um, so I think that's been a great thing. Um, certainly from um, the patients who had been given something and it was probably more feedback from the clinician by the client, they really appreciated the fact that when in passing perhaps a comment was made, whether it was in a physio appointment or an OT assessment, that there was actually acknowledged and something was done about it. It wasn't just, a, oh, I'm sorry you're feeling that way. There was actually an action where they could be referred on to some resources, provided with the resource, and it gave, I think, a gateway or permission for that discussion to happen. So there was something that that clinician could actually do that I think really enhanced that client's holistic care, that we're not just seeing them for whatever the sole purpose of the referral to the physio or the OT was. I think that really nicely highlights the, the role of the multidisciplinary team as well, doesn't it, in nutrition Definitely. care? It certainly um, isn't, you know, dietitians, nutrition obviously is bread and butter, but um, but obviously identification of, of needs, provision of information yeah. is, you know, that, that can be done by anyone. Yep. And and what about on the flip side? What was what was hard? What didn't work? <laughs> um, I think probably not so much what didn't work, but perhaps what we didn't get a chance to actually trial. So some of the things that we had um, ambition around um, was perhaps getting our allied health assistants to actually be a bit more engaged or even our service coordination team um, in doing some of the risk screening um, for the malnutrition, we were hoping we could get that onto some of our assessment forms. Um, but just again, with the reduced capacity of clients coming physically through the clinic and other changes that were happening, um, it's been put on hold until we've got more of a workforce and a, a client group to do that with. Um, I think uh, there was some, I think, reluctance in the beginning to put people putting their hand up and saying, well, that's not my issue, that's the dietitian's problem. Um, but I actually think it's been a nice bridge, if anything, um, to try and bring that nutrition forward to everyone's thinking 
and probably that emphasis on how the nutrition actually affects the treatment or the care that they can give their client. So it's sometimes having to link it back a bit more directly to the impact that better nutrition could have on their strength and balance, their outcomes um, or their future needs. I think that was a really important thing to try and overcome that barrier of it being someone else's problem, not mine. Fantastic. And so obviously as one of our seven sites Mm. that that tested these resources, I guess thinking about those that might be listening to the webinar tonight or or the recording that haven't seen the resources before, have seen them now, can can you give them some tips perhaps Um, about how they might go about utilising the resources in clinical practice? What So some some easy means of, um, (laughs) you know, uh, integrating those into what they're already doing? Mm. So I suppose it depends on your practice a little. Um, From a broad spectrum, we sort of um, put this information out into our staff bulletin. So it was something that was captured. The staff bulletins are something that people can reference back to. So there's like a snapshot on our um, SharePoint where people can go back and actually then look at different sections. So that link, in a sense, remains sort of active. Um, We've also encouraged um, clinicians to have that as part of their sort of favourites on their search engine or bar. So it's something that they can quickly access. Um, We've got the postcards that are in people's rooms. And again, like um, Jane was saying, in the clinic rooms, we've got things on the wall to initiate that. So it's a constant reminder, but it's not something that has to be clinician initiated. It can be client initiated as well. Um, I think for our non-dietitians in particular, um, feeling confident that they were able to give something that was of value and looking at it again, specifically to what the client's saying around either their particular cancer so really focusing them on that um, and going to those specific fact sheets. Um, but we're fortunate in a way at the moment we don't have a long wait for a dietetics appointment, but I feel as though it's also, if there was a wait, it would be something we'd encourage clinicians to give. But I found probably, if anything, from a non-dietetic perspective, it was handing that out as an initial gateway to the conversation opening up and letting the clients know that there are options. Um, and then as we get more specific, they can go to drill down into that next layer of information. But I think the actual health professional information is actually really important. And once they can understand the significance of what can be achieved, um, it actually has a nice flow on to what they want to provide their clients with as well. And just thinking about within your implementation team, did you find that this work raised awareness of mm. the importance of nutrition? Um, you know, for for somebody who has cancer or has had cancer in the context of their overall health? I think it did, and particularly on that longer-term health outcome because we're seeing people typically post their acute care, although we did notice um, as, you know, different things are changing, some people are seeing us while they're still undergoing treatment. Um, And I think, again, linking it back to directly what that particular therapy is trying to achieve and how the nutrition interacts has been important um, I think the video, similar to what you showed um, earlier this evening, was actually great. I went out to different team meetings um, across different disciplines and actually presented that. And I think that was well received and generated interest in conversation, especially around the muscle loss and sarcopenia. And again, they could just see that linkage to what they're seeing at the other end. Uh, that was really great. Um, and I think the myth busting too was something else that a lot of people do sometimes just hazard questions that are thrown at them and they might politely agree um, or they might um, try to contradict the person making those um, suggestions but to have a neutral sort of ground that they can direct people to is a nice option for them as well. Wonderful. Um, Do you have any other comments that you'd like to make Tanith about your team's experience of this work? I think certainly that working within this sort of um, partnership and as one of the implementation sites, it's been a really um, positive experience. Um, And I think for yourself and and Rebecca, certainly um, you've been a great uh, support. Things have been organised and there's been clarity around what our objectives and our tasks were. And I think Jane pointed to the fact too that was also something that we can get benefit from as an organisation beyond the care we're delivering to the clients. So certainly it's a quality improvement activity. Um, certainly in terms of branching out into what resources we have um, and expecting our clinicians to be accessing. Um, It can be now part of our orientation um, as it's an area that we're hoping to get um, some more growth in around that cancer um, support. Um, So I think there's actually other benefits 
from an organisational and multi-D perspective that are really good. Um, I think that as well, um, we've got opportunities to further educate others as well with this. Um, but it's something that people don't need to sit down for chunks of time. They can flick in and flick out. And I think that's a really nice aspect of the resource as well. Um, and it may be something that people can come back to as needed, as opposed to it being a one-off education um, or a very thick manual. Um, they can actually get right in and dig into what they need at the time. Um, so I think in that way, it's quite time efficient um, to be able to access and use. Brilliant. Mm. Well, thank you, Tanfa. We really That's appreciate okay. Access's contribution to this work. Um, I might just throw it to you, Rebecca. Have we got, doesn't look like we've got any questions from the audience? No, no, there's no questions. But if anyone would like to place a question um, in the Q&A, we're happy to take some live questions. In, in lieu of those questions, I'm going to throw a question out to, to both you, Rebecca and Tanith then. I guess for those listening, um, it might be useful to perhaps just talk through how do you find a dietitian working in the community that might have some experience in oncology or, you know, could, could be um, accepting of a, of a referral for a patient with cancer. Um, Rebecca, I might go to you in the first instance. Um, so on the Can Eat Pathway webpage, we have developed um, a fact sheet that might be of use to um, non dietitians GPs and uh, or other health professionals. It's called Finding a Dietitian. And through that, I guess it links back to depending on where someone's at in their cancer um, path, whether they're someone that's still um, very much um, embedded in the acute system and perhaps having quite frequent presentations to the hospital, um, whether they can be linked in um, potentially more closely with their hospital-based clinicians at that point, but perhaps as they sort of step more after that initial treatment being completed and they're entering into that step four, as we've described it in the pathway, um, where they're entering a longer term survivorship um, stage um, or perhaps in a maintenance stage where I guess, you know, there's many people that are in our communities that are living um, well with a, a cancer diagnosis and are on maintenance type therapies and a lot of them can also benefit from some nutrition intervention and support. And so I guess that's where a potential referral at that time point into potentially community-based services, community health, like Access Healthy Community is an example of a community health service, um, linking in potentially via the GP with a chronic disease management plan could be another option to access private um, dietetic um, support that way as well. Uh, not sure if Tavis has got any other thoughts or ideas to offer. Um, I think certainly looking at options that are available to the client. So community health, I think, can offer a really nice option. And we talk about nutrition and we've just been talking about multidisciplinary care as well. And I think that is one of the strengths, I suppose, of many of our community health services in that we can offer a multi-D approach um, in the sense that if we've lost some strength and some muscle. We're not just talking about weight regain. We're also talking about strength regain. So it's that cross referral that then can happen within. You know that some clients end up with diabetes post um, their cancer or during their cancer as well. So again, having that nice linkage with diabetes nurse educators and other services that can be of assistance is really useful. Um, as Rebecca's mentioned, there's different funding opportunities available for people. So the chronic disease care plans can be used. And there's also a myriad of other funding that can subsidise the cost, um, particularly for our lower or medium income clients um, under community health or federal um, funding arrangements where we can actually access things at a much lower cost than perhaps going privately if that is a limitation for people. Um, and of course, they've also got the options of private practitioners as well um, who might welcome the MBS care plans um, or their private health if they do have it, they can get rebates also. So I think there are opportunities for referral. Um, and I guess the big thing is um, not making assumptions that people know it all or don't want a referral um, and knowing that people can self-refer as well. And that can be something we can share with our clients too. It doesn't always mean we have to go back to get that formal referral. In many cases, the client themselves can be their own advocate or their carer can be um, and actually call through to get an appointment. And I think that, again, just puts it back into the consumer in the driving seat and having something they can feel like they can be in control of when perhaps at a time a lot of other things very much feel out of their control. And perhaps if I might just add to that, finding a dietitian um, infographic fact sheet that you can find 
um, on the Can Eat web page um, during the utility testing as well. Um, it was mentioned that a lot of um, non dietitian professionals perhaps had identified a need for potentially a one-on-one -on -one appointment or at least at the very least some information to be provided to a patient um, and they found that that um, fact sheet was actually quite helpful to use because it also prompted them in terms of their conversation that they have with the patient so it talks through you know what is the benefit of seeing a dietitian what does a dietitian do so it can almost be printed off as a non-dietitian as a GP or perhaps as a you know a physiotherapist or other allied health person working in the community and and sit down together with the patient and, and sort of talk through that as a way I guess of understanding how it all fits together um, I think the example Tanith was saying too around um, you know linking in with other goals of care um, if someone's coming to see a physio with the goal of wanting to build strength and and, and gain muscle and things it is about connecting that to you know well how does nutrition play into that as well and and the benefit potentially of then you know accessing further information on nutrition or um, as a individual consult with a dietitian you can use that resource I guess to try and help um, gather understanding and almost acceptance perhaps of a referral from a patient's viewpoint on to see a dietitian for some further support. You're absolutely right, Rebecca, and I think just to add to that too, a lot of the time dietitian, unfortunately, is connected with restriction. Um, and at this point, for most people, we're actually talking about what you can eat and what's important and what's nutritious and what's nourishing. So it actually is about what putting things back in to people's um, world and, and diet. Um, and there may have been a time when they had been overly restrictive for different reasons through their ther therapies or in fear of cancer reoccurring, but it's actually being able to talk through where the evidence is at and what actually can be safely and happily included into a you know healthy eating plan for everybody. And within the Nutrition Navigator package as well um, on the Canic Pathway website, again, um, not only that decision support tool that's written for dietitians, I guess, to figure out where they need to refer or where's most appropriate to refer their patient to, um, but also for GPs, there's an additional section that also talks through, I suppose, the um, impact community health might be able to have in terms of supporting your patient and the difference between a community rehab referral versus a community health referral. Um, and you know, some, some details around how interpreters are frequently used, I guess, in community health um, organisations. So that could be something also that might be helpful for people to know as well. And I think just, I guess, a, an additional plug for a dietitian. <laughs> Obviously, uh, for most people who have or have had a cancer diagnosis, they in most cases have got uh, you know, other things going on in their life, other health conditions, whether it be diabetes or whether it be issues with their heart health or, or whatever. And so um, I think just really important to emphasise a dietitian is an expert in, in nutrition and disease and can offer advice that cuts across whatever health issues that particular individual is having and, and set goals and, and work work with the client to, to make sure that, um, you know, all of the the information that's provided is relevant and appropriate for them as an individual. Um, and I think that's that's really critical in the context of, of cancer care, which can be so complicated on its own, let alone, you know, overlay that with, um, you know, other chronic diseases as well, um, which is very common. It's really important that it is cohesive and not conflicting. Absolutely. We can make those recommendations. Fantastic. And I think we might, I think we still don't have any questions for the audience, but that's okay. We've got some questions that we've got in mind. Um, I think just perhaps one last point of discussion before we before we finish up. Um, in the context of increasing cancer survivors in our community, um, I'd just like to, to put it to both of you then, what what role do you think GPs, GP practices, other health professionals working in the community, um, what, what's their role in regards to nutrition, I think, moving forward, where we know we've got, you know, a lot of people out there that are information hungry? I'm going to throw to Rebecca first. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, we're seeing increasing numbers of, of people diagnosed with cancer, um, increasing um, numbers of people going through treatment, potentially also, you know, increases in notification post-COVID following delays and the like. So I guess we're seeing that pressure potentially at the moment now in health care services too, um, where, you know, there's a lot of people coming through, there, there is a lot of um, 
patients, unfortunately, developing side effects and, and some nutrition related issues as a result of their cancer treatment. Um, and they're trying to navigate, I guess, where to go to get some information. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the nurses that they see every day, potentially when they come into the hospital, when I speak with patients, some of them describe um, when they finish their treatment as they're sort of falling off a cliff because they've lost that sort of um, weekly support and weekly sort of network. So I think we're going to see um, more and more GPs um, becoming involved because patients are going to be coming to them to get that support that they're looking for to try and um, get back, I, I guess, to where they might have been before the start of their cancer treatment. And they're looking for support and they're looking for um, direction as to where to go to access different services as well. So I think um, the screening that can be done potentially as people come in to the GP clinic, whether that's by the practice nurses, as Jane mentioned, they're sort of trialling a bit at DD. Um, and, and keeping sort of those questions first and foremost in mind um, and, and then being able to, I guess, direct people towards some of that information, be it the Can Eat Pathway website, but also I think the GPs have a really terrific role in the community in terms of coordinating care and, and they're really the experts in terms of chronic disease management. So I think if we apply all of what we already do in terms of good practice for diabetes and heart disease and, and look at that with a um, a person presenting that has a cancer diagnosis, we can kind of fall back on, I guess, many of the practices that are already being done, but it's perhaps realising that this is going to keep increasing, sadly, as more and more people have a cancer diagnosis. But I guess more excitingly, as people also um, treatments are becoming more and more advanced and, and we're seeing more and more people sort of um, survive and thrive post cancer treatment, or at least getting towards the thriving part if they can be really well linked in with some support after their treatment. I think one of the things for me is that um, speak up and speak early to people about it. Um, it's very often that we see people and the referral comes through once people have reached um, some symptomatic sort of phases or they already are deconditioned or they have lost, you know, that more than 10% of their body weight. Um, but actually prompting people to recognise that right from the get-go, it's really important. Uh, we talk a lot about those high-risk clients with their head and neck cancers or gastrointestinal cancers, but I think even for your um, breast cancer and other cancers that may be less um, I guess, impacted on, on you know, swallowing and digestion. Um, I think just getting them the right information early that they're not putting themselves on over-restrictive diets, um, but they do have the right um, information and directing them to reputable information early so that they're not sort of Googling 10 things and perhaps even coming to you with 10 different um, potential answers if they can get the correct information from the beginning. It saves a lot of the what-ifs and how-comes and perhaps the endless searching or seeking for things that aren't perhaps going to be in their favour in the long term. Um, so for me, I think it's really investing early and then revisiting often along that journey so that we are picking people up um, more proactively than perhaps reactively, which is often the case. Um, and I guess as in working in community from that acute setting as well, um, you know, if you're getting a discharge summary, we'd love to be seeing more of that discharging directly from the acute setting or subacute setting um, with their supplement regime if they are on nutrition supplements so we can continue to support that. Um, we often do find that people are a bit lost, as Rebecca was saying, once that inpatient care concludes, they might be back at their pharmacy trying to pick something off the shelf um, and it may not be the one that's in their best interest moving forward and being unaware they can access other um, options in the community that may just not be on their pharmacy shelf. Um, so I think we can offer nutrition support with supplementation, but such an uh, other sort of advantageous way of eating um, for them and their families so they can reintegrate into the, the life and the food choices they want to long term. Fantastic. A, a huge thank you to, to you, Tanith, for joining us tonight. Um, and we might close the panel now. So um, I might just, before we finish up, just run through a couple of key messages. Um, so we'll just share a slide for you. So really our, our take home messages for today's webinar. Nutrition is so important for people with or who have had cancer. We, we really love you to walk away from this webinar being aware that common conditions such as malnutrition, sarcopenia and cancer cachexia, um, in many cases, they're preventable if identified early. 
So please play your role, screen for malnutrition and nutrition issues and identify issues early, guide patients and carers to the Canic Pathway resources and refer patients to a dietitian when that's indicated. Hopefully you can utilise some of the, the practical tips that we've discussed throughout the case studies and in our panel session tonight um, and apply those in your workplace. So we'd love you to go and use the Can Eat Pathway resources. They're free and we hope that they're useful to you and, and please share them with your networks. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us by the email address on the screen there. Um, or if you want to connect with us or you've got any questions following this webinar, we thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I'd now like to, to hand back to Yvonne to, to close the webinar. Thank you, Janelle. What so much information to take in, but what a great discussion. Um, thank you so much to yourself, Rebecca, Tanith, and, and Dr. Jane Crow. Um, also, thank you to Phil, who's been in the back end, making sure that the whole session runs smoothly. We had a couple questions in the Q&A just asking about if the session's recorded. Um, yes, it's definitely recorded. You will receive an email in the next few days, which will have a survey link. So please complete the survey link. Let us know what you liked about the session, what else you want to hear about, put any questions, connect with us. The recording will also be on the Northwestern Melbourne PHN webpage, um, where all, um, a lot of our recordings will, will sit. Um, but for now, I just, once again, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for all the great information um, and good night. <laughs>